give you salvation just to possess it. You and I are to become the Christians God saved us to become. Turn with me to the book of Jude in the New Testament, the book of Jude, and we'll begin reading in just a moment with the 20th verse in this book of the Bible. Some have referred to it as the vestibule leading into the revelation of Jesus Christ. If we use that terminology, I don't want you to underestimate God's message in this particular book of the Bible. God has a message for us in his word, 66 books in one book. This is God's revelation of himself to us. And he reveals himself to us. We know that God exists in conscience and in creation. We have this declaration that there is a God. But the Lord wants us to know him. And to know him, he gave us this written revelation of himself. And it is complete only as we take the revelation from each of the 66 books of the Bible. So there is a portion of that in this particular book of Jude. If you had a puzzle with 66 pieces in it and you were missing one piece of the puzzle, the puzzle would be incomplete. And if we do not get what God reveals himself to us as in each of these books of the Bible, we don't have the completed revelation that God wants us to have of himself. So it is God's word, it is God's revelation of himself. If you look with me in Jude, beginning with verse 20. But ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And of some have compassion, making a difference. And if some have compassion, making a difference. If you're in the habit of marking things in your Bible, I want you to mark this last expression in verse 22, making a difference. I've been giving a series of messages on 10 things we must do, 10 things we must do before we die. You don't have to do them. No one's going to make you do them. But we do have an appointment to die. And I've been giving ten things, a message on each. Learn to love the Lord our God with all our heart. Number two, to love thy neighbors thyself. Number three, to add to your faith. Don't, don't be satisfied with saying, I'm a Christian. The Lord has saved us for a purpose. We need to become the Christians God has saved us to become. Number four, have a thoroughly Christian home. Number five, develop the gift of God in you. Number six, become a spiritual person. There's so much tragedy in God's work today because there are not enough spiritual people. Galatians 6 says, ye which are spiritual, restore such in one. We're missing spiritual people. Number seven, gain perspective. We're to gain perspective. Number eight, we're to be a faithful witness of his grace. Number nine, we're to enjoy our lives. God has designed that our lives are to be enjoyed. And number 10, I give this message today, we're to make a difference in the life of someone. We're to make a difference in the life of someone. I thank God for all his blessings. I'm a blessed person. I know God has blessed me in a, in a wonderful way. God has blessed me. But also I'm grateful to God for the people God has used to make a difference in my life. And God has used people to make a difference in my life. And whether you realize it or not, the Lord has used people to make a difference in your life. I want you to remember this. The degree of our allowing God to make a difference in our life has everything to do with how we can be used of God and make a difference in other people's lives. In other words, as my life is open to the Lord and the Lord is allowed to make a difference in my life, 
as my life is open to God and I allow the Lord to make a difference in me, He enables me to be used of Him to make a difference in the lives of others. And this is what it's all about. I could give you a list of names, some pastors, some lay people who were not pastors, some men, some women, even young people that were used of God to make a difference in my life. And I'm so grateful for that. Often that we're, we're looking at things like we're going to find some meek and lowly person and we're going to reach out and make a difference in that person's life. But sometimes it's the other way around. There are those who seem to be the meek and lowly who are used of God to make the differences in our lives. There wouldn't be a Lee Robertson today. We wouldn't remember the great Lee Robertson as a pastor of the Highland Park Baptist Church and Tennessee Temple Schools if it hadn't been for J.R. Faulkner. Dr. Faulkner was used of God to be an encouragement to make a difference in Dr. Robertson's life. That's just one example of many that I could give. But are you being used of God to make a difference in someone's life? Now, I want you to notice the context of this. Look at the expressions given in the book of Jude. In the midst of all of this, in the midst of this, look at verse 4. There are those that are creeping in unawares. In verse 4, there are also ungodly men. There are those who turn the grace of God into lasciviousness. That's unleashed sexual desire. Notice, please, in verse 6, there are angels that have been expelled from heaven and are reserved in everlasting chains under darkness under the judgment of the great day. Notice in verse 8, they're filthy dreamers. They're those who defile their flesh. They're those who despise dominion. Notice also in verse 10, they're those who speak evil of those things which they know not. There are those in verse 10 who corrupt themselves. Also in verse 12, God says they're those who are twice dead. In verse 13, they're foaming out their own shame. They're reserved for the blackness of darkness forever. God's coming to execute judgment in verse 15. These are ungodly sinners. They are murmurs, verse 16. They're complainers. They walk after their own lusts. Verse 18 says they are mockers in the last time. In verse 19, they're sensual people who do not know the Holy Spirit of God. And with all of that going on, with all those types of people identified, the Lord says we're in the midst of those people. And we're to be used of God to make a difference in the lives of someone. Are we making the difference in the lives of someone be specific about it. I've said so many times, nothing can be dynamic unless it's specific. Jesus Christ came to make a difference. If you'll hold your place here and turn with me to the Gospel according to John in the 20th chapter of the Gospel according to John, we understand the Lord Jesus came. He was sent. He became a man without ceasing to be God. He came to die for our sin debt. He who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. The Bible says, as he speaks of himself in John chapter 20 and verse 21, Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you. As my Father has sent me, even so send I you. As my Father sent me, even so send I you. He was sent to make a difference. The Bible says, If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Now, we cannot save lost souls. We could no more convert someone to Christ and be the means of that conversion as far as doing the converting is concerned than we could go out and create something. But we can be the spokespeople who tell people about Jesus and God can use us to make a difference. If I brought you attention, if I brought your attention something of uh, the medical nature, something that was a, a debilitating disease and you had the answer and you and I did not give the answer or something that could save a life and we didn't offer help to save that life, we'd be expected to be called criminal in our behavior. But we know the way of salvation.
only those who know can tell those who don't know. Not only do we know the way of salvation, we should know the way of the victorious Christian life. I was in a Bible class just moments ago, and I don't say this to embarrass anyone, but our men in that class are converted men. They're saved. They've come to know the Lord as their Savior, and they've been converted from everything imaginable, from a life of drunkenness and wild, sensual living. Many of the horrible things you might imagine people do, they've once been guilty of that, but now they've been washed in the precious blood of Jesus Christ. They've been made whole in Him. You know why? Someone was used of God to make a difference in their lives. But it doesn't stop there. It starts there. Because we are to tenderly work and pray and encourage, patiently working to bring people along as they grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want us to return to a passage just for a moment in the book of 1 Corinthians. Would you turn there with me? I called your attention to this earlier in this series of messages in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. There are really 16 things God says here about charity or love. This benevolent love. But note just a few of them. You can mark them all, and I hope you do mark all of them in these 16 things you have marked in your Bible. In chapter 13 and verse 4. It says, Charity suffereth long and is kind. Notice, if we're going to make a difference in people's lives, we have to be bathed in, in, in kindness. Kindness. The Word of God even says of the virtuous woman in Proverbs chapter 31, I believe it's the 26th verse, that she has a tongue that has the law of kindness. She wants to make a difference in her home. Law of kindness, it sounds like something that doesn't really go together. But it's, it's right, it's the law but it is spoken in kindness. If we're going to be used of God, we need to have kindness. Notice he also says here, doth not behave itself unseemly. The word unseemly means something that is not true to Christian character or to the Christian life. We can do nothing unseemly if we're going to make a difference for Christ in the lives of people. He says, Seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked. And on it goes. There are things that characterize these 16 things. I want you to go over them and over them and ask God as you pray and read this passage from 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Stop after each one of these and pray, Lord, help me to be this kind of person. For example, you say, Lord, pray and ask God, God, help me be one who suffers long, that has patience with people. Lord, help me to envy not, to be satisfied in thee. Lord, help me not to be vaunted up. That means puffed up, a braggart, talking about all you've done. Help me to be a humble person. Just go through the entire list and ask God, because when we're these kind of people, characterized by these 16 things, that characterize the life of love given out, then we can make a difference in the lives of others. I said to you earlier, only as we allow God to make a difference in our lives can we truly make a godly difference in the lives of others. Selfishness destroys us. If you look back in the book of Jude just for a moment, I want you to look at this word in verse 22, compassion, and if some have compassion, if we don't have that compassion and the word actually means something that can be given only by divine grace study it for yourself this particular word this compassion can only be something imparted to us by divine grace as it's used here in other words, it's not just something we work up. Well, I, I see some poor pitiful people. I saw a picture on the television of somebody and sent money. I'm making a difference. I'm not talking about that. The difference we're after 
is the difference that only Christ can make in a person's life. And we want to see them come to know Christ as Savior, ask God to forgive their sin, and trust the Lord Jesus as their Savior, and live a life fruitfully for Him, faithfully for Him. And may God help us. But this particular word, compassion, has to be imparted in us by divine grace. We don't get it anywhere but from Jesus Christ. And its goal will be to see people saved. You remember the man in John chapter 9 we've looked at in John chapter 9? You remember the man that was born blind and the Lord gave him eyesight, but it didn't stop there? Finally, he, he said Jesus is the one who did this, and they cast him out of the synagogue. And when the Lord found him cast out of the synagogue, Christ came to the man. He found him and came to him and declared to him, when the man said, who is the Son of God? Jesus Christ said to this man in John chapter 9, the one you're looking at right now is the Son of God, and the one who you're hearing right now is the Son of God. And the man said, I believe him was saved. And so the goal wasn't just to give the man who was blind from his birth eyesight. The goal was to bring him to the saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you and I are really being used of God to make a difference in someone's life, then the goal we have, if it's really out of compassion, which is by divine grace toward that person, God's love should have brought in our hearts toward that person, then the goal will be that we are not going to stop until we know that person knows Christ as Savior and is living a life faithfully for the Lord. You see, we grow as we allow God to use us to make a difference in the lives of others. We develop by all of this. It's best for us. When the Lord designed it this way, he had all, not only the good of another person in mind, the best for another person in mind, but also what's best for us. You find a selfish mother in a home. There are mothers who are selfish. I'm sorry to say it, but I've met some. They're selfish. They don't care for their children as they ought to care for their children. But you find a mother who's a selfish mother, and you're going to find a woman who's unhappy. You find a happier mother who cares and loves her children as God desires her to care and love for her children. It works that way with everything. It's in our best good, in our best interest, to say, Lord, use me to make a difference in the life of someone else. I want you to write this down quickly, would you please? I want us to consider the task of the job to be done, the task. And there's some confusion here. There's a lot of confusion in churches. There's a lot of confusion among Christians about this matter. Just because we have the tools doesn't mean we've entered into the task. Some people say, well, you know, I, I, I'm able to do that. I could take time to do that. You may even say, I have the patience to do that. But talking about it doesn't mean we're doing it. Now, the writer here in Jude lists all these ugly things that are going on in the world in an apostate condition. And God tells us that these people are doing these things. And in the midst of all of that, God says, I want my people. Look, look, please. But ye, verse 20, but ye, you're not like the rest of the world. But ye, beloved, you're different. You've been saved. You've been cleansed. You've been washed in his blood. Your sin's forgiven. You've discovered the secret of victory in Christ. You have a job to do. Well, you know what we find ourselves doing? We find ourselves talking about everything that's wrong in the world and what we don't like about everything. And we sound almost as hopeless as the unbelievers sound hopeless. That is not what God intends for his children. He wants to use us to make a difference in someone's life. And we must live that way. I thank God for the people who touched my life. And they touched me with the love of God. And when they did, it was as if God was touching my life and changing my life. We're talking about the task here. Not just having the tools. You say, well, you have a church. That doesn't mean the church is engaged in doing this. 
You say, we have neighbors in need. That doesn't mean that you're helping your neighbors. You say, I know a boy that could be greatly helped. That doesn't mean you're helping him. You may say, I know a girl that if she doesn't get straightened out, I'll tell you one thing, I know where she's headed. Well, let me tell you something. Just knowing about this child doesn't mean you've entered into the task of making a difference in her life. And so the Lord stops us in our tracks here. He says, hold it. You're going to be living in a world like this. This is just the way it is. But I want you to make a difference in the life of someone. And may God help us to do it. You have to, you have to say, to whom? To whom? The person who says, I want, to, I want to be used of God in the whole wide world, that person will never be used. It's just like the prayers we offer. Lord, bless everybody. Those prayers don't get answered. They don't get answered because they're not real prayers. There's no real burden to that. There are individuals who need the Lord and individuals who know the Lord must go after those individuals who need the Lord. The task we must take it on is our personal work. As the Father sent me, Jesus said, even so, Send I you. And you know, when Dr. Howard came after me, a medical doctor, a pediatrician, came after me as a child, it was Jesus coming after me. When Dr. J. William Harbin, the pastor of the First Baptist Church, came after me to lead me to Christ, it was Jesus coming after me. When Dillard Hagen, my, my pastor, came after me, he didn't just put his arm around me, he took me into his heart to nurture me and help me and encourage me. When Brother Hagen did that, that was Jesus coming to help me. When Mrs. Lawhorn said, we're going to drive by there every Sunday morning and pick you up and bring you to Sunday school, that was Jesus Christ driving that car, coming by to get me. I understand that now. And you and I must understand, there was a decision that people made that would cost them there were things I would do that would disappoint them. There was progress I would not make that they wanted me to make. But they took on the task to make a difference in my life. And we must take on that task individually. There's a second thing I want you to write down. That's the training. The training. I want you to turn with me, please, to the little book of 3 John. Just back just a bit from Jude. The third John. Notice the expression God uses here in third John, verse 8. We therefore ought to receive such that we might be fellow helpers to the truth. To the truth. Statistically, you could get information about people who start using drugs in a given day. They tell me in America 5,000 people start using cocaine or some other drug similar to that every day in America. Statistically, you could find out how many people are addicted to prescription drugs or how many people are alcoholics and how many of them are drunkards who are teenagers. All these things, statistically, someone could give us information and we could read about 10% of this or 15% of this and whatever the case may be. But you know, that's meaningless. It's meaningless unless it's someone we know whose life is broken. It's meaningless. There could be a thousand people drowned from a shipwreck in the China Sea today. And we wouldn't even flinch if we heard the news. We wouldn't flinch. Because things like that have happened and we don't flinch. We don't even flinch. We don't bat an eye. We don't even raise a brow because we don't know them. There's nothing real to us unless it's personal to us. And so we must enter into this personally, one life touching another life for good and for God. 
May I tell you that you have to get far down the line to understand some of these truths and that you wish you knew when you were much younger? For example, a parent finally realizes when their children are gone, they could have made no greater investment than the investment they made in their own children. But most of the time, a parent has to learn that after the kids are gone, especially if someone's done something he or she should not have done. But then we say, I wish I'd known that earlier. If I had my life to live over, I don't know what would be on the list of things I would change, but one thing I would change. I would definitely change. I'd be less enamored with big things and devote myself and encourage others to devote themselves more and more to individuals, 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 individuals. Training someone. That's different from teaching. It requires, it requires hands-on. It requires a lot of love, a lot of encouragement. As a mother would teach her daughter how to cook, there's a lot of messes to be made in the kitchen that the mother would not have made if she were not trying to train a daughter. Or a worker trying to train someone on the job to do his or her work and there's going to be mistakes made and sometimes money lost just trying to train someone. And there has to be a lot of patience and help. Well, if we've discovered truth, truth, that's what it's about, helping people to the truth. If we've discovered truth about God and God's Word, then we're obligated to God to bring other people along to teach them that same truth. Whether we ever realize it or not, we're obligated to God and we're going to give an account to God. So that's one of our big issues, dismissing our accountability. Those who know will answer to God in their generation for those who do not know. That's not even a question. It will be done. Those who know owe those who do not know the message of salvation. There's no way to escape it. There's just no way to escape it. And may God help us to understand this training takes time. Look, there are things that I wanted to accomplish 40 years ago, starting out preaching, that I'm still working on getting done. Specifically working on it, still hadn't come to pass, but it's worthwhile. Someone said to me the other day, do you have pastors? Out? Yes, we have about 200 pastors we've trained who are out pastoring churches, about 200 of them, and many more coming on. We have people all over this world that have been trained right here in this place. They're on every continent. But if I had it to do over and I thought about all the trouble, all the problems you go through, all the turmoil one has, all the money that has to be raised, if you had to look at that up front and say, this is the cost, this is what it's going to take, you'd never enter into it. But God, by His grace, gives us grace and strength to go through it, doesn't He? At the moment we have a need, God provides the need. If you look at your life and your family and your children, if you, if you knew everything imaginable that you're going to have to deal with, you'd throw up your hands and say, I can't do this. But God comes alongside us and enables us as we seek to train and bring others along in the wonderful things of the Lord. It has to be done this way. So there must be training. And we ought to know and know specifically and understand. That's why I want to give myself to God and God's Word because I have an obligation to tell others about the Lord and His Word. Parents ought to dig into God's Word and let God's Word dig into them because they owe it to their children to teach them God's Word. Then there's a third word. I want you to write it down. Not only, not only the task must be entered in, not be confused just with having the tools, but get on the job and the training, but... The third thing, if we're going to really make a difference in someone's life, there must be trust. Trust. I'm going to say something that's very hard for me to say. It's very hard for me to say. But there are people that you know sometimes for 10 years or 20 years or 30 years or 40 years 
and you try, you work at it, but you still are not able to trust them. You're not able to trust them. Wouldn't it be a wonderful place, and wouldn't our lives be so much better if everyone with whom we have relationship was a trustworthy person? Now listen, listen please. Instead of turning it out that way and looking at everybody else, let's take just a moment and turn it in and say, by God's grace, I will be a trustworthy person. I'll be a person that can be trusted. My dad was in the wrong kind of business, as you well know if you've listened to me long. But thank God he was saved. He came to know Christ as his Savior before he died. And I'll see him in heaven. And I'm so thankful for that. So thankful. But even my dad in the awful business he was in would get me in the living room of the house and he would say, Now, son, stand up straight. Look me in the eye. Shake my hand. A man's word is his bond. If you say it, you're going to do it. Be that kind of man. Be that kind of man. And don't be flippant about your talk because if you say you're going to do it, even if you're just casually speaking about something and say, I'll be there, someone is believing you're going to be there and do that. And I remember those lessons from childhood. But it's God that enables us to be trustworthy people. Let me show you an example of this from the Bible. I want you to look at an unfamiliar book, the book of Philemon. Just one another one of these books with one chapter. Paul is writing from Rome and he writes this letter to Philemon. And perhaps you know there's a runaway slave of the name of Onesimus. He's run to Rome. He's met Paul. He's been converted and Paul sends him back to do the right thing, make restitution. And by the way, there's some of that that needs to be done. You need to go back to people that you, you've done wrong to if they know it, and you need to say, I wasn't a Christian then, I wasn't living the Christian life then, but I want you to know God's changed my life now. But I want you to sense what Paul is saying here as he writes this letter about the care of Onesimus. Now, if you had been Philemon and you'd had a, a worker like Onesimus who stole from you and ran away, you might not want to see him again. Do you realize how many people are trying to deal with their past and can't deal with it? Do you realize how many people can't sleep because of their past? Do you realize how many people can't look another person in the face like they ought to because of their past? Satan invited you in and said, come on in. It's wonderful. Enjoy yourself. Live as you please. But it wasn't long until you were filled with guilt and doubt and shame. I want you to know when God saves your lost soul and forgives your sin, your past no longer exists. You won't meet it again. You won't see it again. It was seen on Calvary when Jesus Christ bled and died for your sin and became sin for you and died as you. And praise His holy name. All that filth doesn't have to be there again for us to meet somewhere. And so Paul is writing here, encouraging Philemon to receive Onesimus, this man Onesimus, and treating him right. And notice what he says. We begin with verse 4. I thank my God, making mention of thee always in my prayers, hearing of thy love and faith which thou hast toward the Lord Jesus and toward all saints, that the communication of thy faith may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. For we have great joy and consolation in thy love, because the bowels of the saints are refreshed by thee, brother. Wherefore, though I might be much bold in Christ to enjoin thee that which is convenient. And here it is, one of the most tender things in all the Bible. Paul says to this man, Paul writing from prison said this man, yet for love's sake, I rather beseech thee, being such an one as Paul the aged, and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ. Paul says, there's some things I need you to do. 
I want you to do these things for this runaway slave who's been converted. And he said, I could, I could put a little pressure on you. Evidently, evidently Philemon is a Christian because Paul had led him to Christ. There's a great deal of influence here. But he says, look please, you and I love one another in the Lord. You see, it's not just between me and you. You and I love one another in the Lord. We share a mutual love for Jesus Christ and the change Christ has made. And Paul says, Philemon, for love's sake. We don't have to sign contracts. We don't have to threaten people. We don't have to say, if you don't do that, I will do this. No, 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 no. no. There's a trust between us for love's sake. And you know, one of these days, one of these days, just as Jesus Christ literally, literally turned his work over to his disciples, there has to be trust in this. He actually put in the hands of his followers his work, he put it in their hands. Look, please, he put it in their hands. He sent the Holy Spirit, and the Spirit of God came to empower them to do it, but he trusted them with it. You and I will someday put our influence, our lives, all we've done, sooner than we think, in the hands of someone else to carry on. There's no doubt about that. We don't live forever here. Most of the time you think, well, it's our children. It's not always the children who carry on the work of God. Many more can. Do you know who's going to be there to trust and to leave it in their hands if there hasn't been a loving, Christ-centered relationship built where we can trust you to do this? I think often that my labor will be in vain here. To a great extent, my labor will be in vain here if I don't come alongside people and with the love of God take on the task to train others that I can trust to carry on. And surely, there are things precious to you about Jesus, about who he is. And you'd like to train someone. Take that task. Trust them. Both of you love the Lord now. Helping them grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. There's no doubt in my mind, the earlier we start doing this, the more pleased God is going to be with our work. Before I die, before you die, before you die, ask God to use you in the life of someone else in the biggest way possible, in the biggest way possible. Let's bow in prayer, may we? I want you to sit quietly just for a moment. We're going to pray together that God's word won't be stolen by the devil and by his demons, that the seed won't be snapped up. So let us pray together that it will be sealed in our hearts. All around, let us pray together. Father, we know someday we have an appointment with thee. There's an inevitable meeting. We shall meet thee. And I've tried by thy leading to just give some ideas about things we should do before we have that meeting. And I know in my heart, Lord Jesus, I know in my heart by what I've read concerning the training given to thy disciples and to others, that the difference was made in their lives. 
And I've made this attempt to try to emphasize this very same thing. Dear God, help us to take on the task and not continue to live such selfish, self-serving lives. Help us to understand more of the training that was given by thee to those who followed thee in prayer, understanding of thy word, witnessing, trusting thee in crisis, living in the victory that we have in thee. God, help us to know these things, experience these things so we can help others with these things. And may we, may we have people alongside us and we alongside them that we can trust as they trust us and we both trust thee, that we can rejoice in when we finished our race. Are they finished theirs? We believe this to be the way thy work is to be done. Help us, Jesus. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. Be patient with me, please. How many of you know someone now looking in your mind's eye towards someone in whose life you could make a great difference if you just decided you're going to seek the Lord's help to do it. You're thinking of a particular person. It might, it might be someone who's elderly, who's alone. It might be someone very young, like I'm thinking of myself when people came alongside me and said, I'm going to help that boy. I'm going to help that boy. I'm going to make a choice to help that boy for the things of God. It might be a young mother for some of you mothers or a young father for some of you fathers. I want you to look outside your own home a moment, but don't neglect your home. That's where it ought to begin. How many of you can think of someone that way, a real person? Would you lift your hand? Hold it high, would you please? Real high, would you please? You have someone on your mind, someone on your heart right now. Let me try it again. Men, how many of you men can think of someone? Would you raise your hand? Men? How many of you women could think of some, some woman or someone? Thank you. If you raise your hand and you have someone on your heart, we're going to pray for those people. I want you who raised your hands to stand, please. Would you? Just all over the building. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. Please be patient with me. Now, I don't want you to get in a hurry. But if you'll say to the Lord, Lord, I want you to use me. This is the person. And I believe this person's on my heart. I want you to use me for your glory to make a difference in this person's life. I'm going to ask you to leave your place and come and have just a prayer. It's this serious to me. Our world's in a wreck, people. If you can do that, Yes. And we're going to have a prayer together. That means we're going to pray for them all the time. We're praying for them, praying for them. We're not going to try to teach them anything without praying for them. We're not going to, we're not going to try to instruct them without praying for them. God help us. And if some have compassion, making a difference. Come on around this way. Help us, please. Yes. Yes. We're going to pray. Come on around, please. We're going to pray. Now, there are people here who do not know Jesus as their Savior. I want you to come. Let us take the Word of God and show you how to, how to be saved. If some of you are coming because you've been saved but never baptized, I want you to come and tell us what God's put in your heart. How many of you know the Lord has your attention and you're still seated, but there's a matter you need to settle with God about salvation, or professing Christ publicly, some matter in your life, forgiveness and cleansing? 
Would you lift your hand? Hold it high. Some matter you need to settle if you're really going to get things right with God. Then you leave your place. We're here. We're waiting. We're walk, working, praying with people. I know it's a little unusual to do it this way. I know it is. I want us to sing, Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come, I come. We're going to sing that verse, and we're going to have a prayer, and let these folks go in just a moment who are here praying. Right where you're seated, we're going to sing it. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to thee, thou bidst me come to thee.